Hello everyone, what's up? Last week I finished painting and weathering a Terex Termite for YouTube Luminary Leaky Cheese. In today's video we will look at the main highlights in the process, such as base coating with Tamiya paints, weathering metals, using stencils, or applying pigments. If this sounds interesting, keep watching! The first step I wanted to cover in today's video is how to paint and weather bare metal. For this I'm using Tamiya XF56 Metallic Grey, which is an alcohol-based acrylic paint, thinned with Tamiya Lacquer Thinner with Retarder. I'm mixing it approximately 60% paint to 40% thinner, then decanting it into the airbrush cup, and I'm spraying this at around 20 psi with my Badger Patriot 105. I quite like this paint, but the size of the metal flakes that I got was far too large for my taste. Fortunately, once weathered, this was barely noticeable, if at all. So, as you can see here, this Tamiya XF paint airbrushes very easily when mixed with the lacquer thinner. It sprays really smoothly, despite the fact that metallic paints are notoriously hard to airbrush. I'm applying light coats, but shooting paint almost continuously through the airbrush, which yes, I know I shouldn't do, and in spite of this, I had no clogs or dry tip whatsoever. In conclusion, these lacquer paints are extremely forgiving. So if, like me, you're by no means an expert at airbrushing, they will allow you to get good results consistently. On top of that, it is hard to get problems like spider webbing or pooling, even at high pressures. Yet another benefit is that the lacquer thinner makes this coat really tough and durable, which is great for our future weathering stages. Anyway, time for one more pass. I prefer to do multiple light coats rather than a single heavy one. It's more work, of course, but I find that the finish I get is superior. The first step in weathering the bare metal areas is to airbrush and enamel wash in order to tint them. The wash that I prefer is the Ammo Dark Wash, which is kind of a very dark green. The main purpose of this is not to apply a wash as such, that is to say for the enamel to pull in the recessed areas. Instead, what we want is what military modelers call a filter. For this, I thin the enamel 50% with Ammo Autoless Thinner, and for this I chose my Pache Talon with a very large 0.7mm needle. I was still afraid of clogs, so I increased the pressure to 22 psi, and you can see that I was kind of blasting it. In spite of this, there is almost no pulling of paint at all, and as you can see, it is really tinting our metal, making it slightly greenish, and it's also giving it a more matte appearance. Thanks to this, the metal flakes that I didn't initially like in that Tamiya paint were now almost invisible. Now it's time for a more conventional enamel wash. Before this step, I gave the model a coat of Johnson's Pledge, which acts as an acrylic gloss varnish. The enamel in this case is the black wash from Ammo, which I'm mixing 50-50 with Ammo or less thinner. The other paint well just has some more thinner, and it's for cleaning my brush. So, as I've said before in other videos, you should apply the wash with a dabbing or stippling motion. In this case, I'm really flooding the area, so I'm not being as careful as usual. 
I'm using a large round brush loaded with the wash. By the way, the varnish in this case is meant to protect the previous layer of enamels. And it also enhances capillary action greatly, making the wash flow much better into the recesses. If I wanted to blend it afterwards, it would also make that much easier. If I hadn't applied the varnish, the thinner in this wash would have reactivated the enamel that I applied through the airbrush and then probably ruined the whole burnish metal effect. By the way, the masking that I applied previously was also meant to prevent the wash from getting into the armor panels of the Terex. The use of the camo putty for the outermost edges really helped with this, saving me time with the cleanup. Now we're going to airbrush the base coat using Tamiya lacquer paints. I did use the term loosely before, because we were adding lacquer thinner, but this is Tamiya LP7 Pure Red, which unlike the paints in the XF range, is literally a lacquer. The Tamiya LP series is mostly used by scale modelers who do modern civilian vehicles like rally cars and the like. This paint has all the advantages that I mentioned before, but I would say that they're dialed up to 11. The price that you pay is its increased toxicity and the fact that a very strong solvent will be required to clean your airbrush thoroughly. Tap water will only make a huge mess and even 99% IPA may not always be enough. The fumes from this are highly toxic, so make sure to use a respirator and a spray booth if you go for this paint. As you can see, this paint has extremely good coverage, it airbrushes super smoothly, and in my opinion, has a beautiful finish. When thin, the paint is also fairly transparent, despite that good coverage, allowing pre-shading or pre-highlighting to be seen through quite easily. This also makes color modulation much easier to accomplish. The fact that these LP paints are extremely tough is an added bonus. That was one of the reasons why I use LP paints almost exclusively for my Warhound Titan, about which I did a little showcase video a while ago. As you can see, I'm a bit like cataphractic terminators in 6th ed, slow and purposeful. The masking that you can see is a combination of Tamiya masking tape and masking putty, which I quite like, as you might have noticed if you have watched some of my previous videos. Thanks to this masking, I had very little to no overspray, thankfully, and it was also quite easy to apply and then to remove. In this third part of the video, I'm going to show you how I painted some areas in white using masking on the one hand and stencils on the other. The white paint is Tamiya XF2 flat white, thinned about 40% with Tamiya lacquer thinner. As usual, the airbrush I used was my Badger Patriot 105 with a 0.5mm needle at around 20 psi. Here you can see the masking that I did. I wanted to do some panels in white, to do decals inside and to break up the red so as not to make the paint job too so monotonous. You will probably be thinking that applying white over red is utter madness. However, with these paints, you can see how easy it is to cover the red. Yes, I have to do a few passes, but so long as you do light coats, the results will be quite nice, very near complete opacity, even over red. I guarantee you this would be extremely hard to do with acrylic paints, or at least I know that it would be for me.
Now for the stencil work. Applying these stencils was a lot harder than I thought, due to the fact that the Terax does not have an even surface. It would have been much easier to apply the stencil only on the doors, but that wasn't the look I was going for, so I took pretty big risks and I decided to lay the stencil as flat as I could and hope for the best. I tried to make sure to airbrush the white at a 90 degree angle to the surface of the Terex to minimize the overspray, which I knew was bound to happen. To be honest, if the miniature had just been for my collection, I would have been fine with the idea of having some imperfections. However, because I was doing this for Licky Cheese, who I've been a huge fan of since his very first video, I was getting pretty stressed at this stage, I will confess. I was scared that the results would be a disaster, and that I would have to reapply the red completely. Thankfully, that wasn't the case, and I was able to touch up the overspray without a lot of hassle. You cannot imagine how relieved I was when I removed the stencils and saw that the result wasn't that bad. A word on the stencils, though. These are from Fallout Hobbies, and it is their Chevron set. This is the fourth set from them that I use, and I must say I highly recommend them. These are made of self-adhesive vinyl, they're easy to apply and reusable, and they conform to the surface of the miniature really well. In this case, my difficulties had nothing to do with the product. These stencils have allowed me to do things that I could never have pulled off otherwise. Now, I've seen people do amazing things by creating shapes with masking tape, but let's say my dexterity score, to use an RPG analogy, is completely inadequate for such tasks. So to sum up, I highly recommend you get stencils if you're into airbrushing. Now it's time for weathering pigments. I'm applying the Europe Earth pigment from Ammo with a large makeup brush. This was the first time I used one of these brushes, and I must say I really like the results. I will use these for pigments in the future instead of my usual dedicated weathering brushes. As you can see, I'm applying it quite liberally. You don't have to be scared. This pigment from Ammo has a really nice realistic color. My original plan was to use three different pigments, but I liked this one so much that I decided against it. They weren't lying about the name either, this is exactly the color of the dirt in the region of Germany where I live. The other day while cycling I went over a section of asphalt that had been covered in dirt by a tractor and the first thing that came to mind was, look, exactly like the pigment on the Terax. I kid you not. So here you can see how even the red areas have been covered in a thin layer of dirt. Some of you probably gasped and thought I was going mad. Well, the fact is, I debated for a long time whether to go for absolute realism or whether to keep the vehicle pretty and show more of the paint job. After much deliberation, I settled for the former rather than the latter. In terms of the narrative for the vehicle, I wanted to convey the idea of a well-worn veteran of war and also of a termite which had just drilled its way to the surface. As such, the vehicle would necessarily be covered in dust, and there was no way that worn, chipped red paint would have repelled the dirt. Admittedly, this rendered some of the work that I haven't showed you kind of invisible, such as the oil dots that I had carefully applied to give the red panel some tonal variation. But still, I have no regrets. I believe this is the way a Terex would look upon reaching the surface. Now you can see how I'm applying the Ammo Pigment Fixer, which is enamel-based. It's very easy to apply using capillary action.
The pigments look a bit funny when wet. You might be alarmed the first time you use them, but there is no reason to be concerned. Once the pigment dries, the area will have the same dusty look that you want. Just remember to lightly dab it at the surface and to let it do its job by itself. Do not drag the fixer across surfaces. Anyway, this part is easy and enjoyable. At this stage I could already imagine how the Terex would look upon completion, and I was getting quite excited. And here are finally the finished results. I hope that you found the techniques and products that I've demonstrated today really useful. And of course I hope that Leaky Cheese will be happy with his new Terex. This is the second Terex that I paint, and I honestly think that this one looks much better than my own. Making these videos for you guys is really pushing my own skills as a modeler, and I hope that we can continue to learn together with these tutorials. If that sounds good to you, subscribe now. And remember, in the grim darkness of the 31st millennium, there is only weathering. <laughs>